presenting uh, Prof. Salwa Al-Khattab, our uh, second uh, lecture speaker about, uh, so she's talking tonight about thyroid and adrenal emergencies. Prof. Salwa Khattab is, Salwa Al-Khattab, sorry for that, uh, is an assistant professor at the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care and Pain Medicine in Shams University, and uh, she is leading the Merdash Surgical Intensive Care as well. Uh, so she's talking tonight about one of the most important topics that I myself had in my MD exam and in Arab board exam, and it came as well in the Irish Fellowship of Anesthesia. So three exams are like mentioning these type of questions or these topics. So uh, please uh, watch carefully and Prof Salwa, you can unmute yourself, please, and start sharing your presentation kindly. Thank you, Dr. Walid. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, um, actually, Masa Al Khir, uh, same like Professor Baghi told us. Um, I really, uh, yeah, uh, um, it was a very, a very, very comprehensive and valuable uh, lecture. I hope uh, to start our lectures together. Uh, so, uh, to, tonight we will speak about, let us to start. Uh, actually, um, the question is why we are uh, taking from your time to cover these two topics. Uh, what is the Im importance of uh, having a thyroid and adrenal emergencies in particular to speak about? Um, it's not they are uh, yani, it's not that much common uh, to see a patient in either thyroid or adrenal hyper or hyper functions coming in emergencies actually they are uncommon or even rare but they are fatal and the mortality uh, is still high for both of them even with advancement of the diagnosis and treatment the point is that it is a preventable mortality. That's why we have to diagnose to catch the patients suffering from either thyroid or adrenal emergencies in a proper time. So not to miss them, it is a preventable mortality. So let us to start. This is question to start out about talking about our topic today. What is uh, true about thyroid and adrenal emergencies? They are very common health problem. There, are, there is no age or sex discrimination. Uh, they are potentially fatal with high mortality rate. They are easy to diagnose due to clear distinct symptoms and signs. What do you think? Can you see the results, Prof. Salwa? Yes, yes. Uh, most of uh, answers coming, they are potentially fatal with high mortality rate. I agree totally with this one. So let us to proceed. Uh, in, in endocrine emergencies, usually there is a failure of some aspects of the complex system of hormones regulation and feedback loops, which represent the interaction between hypothalamus, particularly from one side, and the side of hormone release from the other side. This failure, if not well treated and promptly treated, uh, it might turn into a nightmare especially in the presence of a trigger. Usually there is a trigger in this situation uh, and it will result in a life-threatening problem. Um, the, the big problem here is there is a very big uh, diagnostic dilemma. Diagnosis actually is not easy at all. You have to differentiate between a lot of causes uh, which can uh, mimic the same presentation. Uh, the management in ER and ICU is very important. So timely management, proper management, starting from ER and then continued in intensive care units is of great importance to prevent a deadly condition. So tonight we will cover thyroid emergencies, uh, namely thyroid storm or myxedema coma, and also adrenal emergencies, acute Addisonian crisis, and phacomocytoma. We will speak about definitions and background, the risk and triggers factors, clinical presentation, labs and radiological finding, and emergent management. To start with thyroid hyperfunction. Actually, thyroid hyperfunction is a state of hyper. It's exaggerated condition. 
This is a case, it's a real life a case, 53 years old female patient presented to ER with acute onset of severe respiratory distress. She gave medical history of asthma and hypertension. She reported the chronic history of palpitation, anxiety, tremors, insomnia, heat intolerance. She also complained unintended body weight loss of 40 kg over the last three years. She gave no history about any thyroid illness or treatment. On examination, her vitals was like that, blood pressure 180 over 135, heart rate 150, respiratory rate 44, oxygen saturation 70 on room air with temperature 38.3. Physically, uh, she had exosalmos of both eyes, and uh, there is a swelling in the neck, goiter, and there is a hand tremors. Uh, here we can see the chest X-ray and her uh, 12 lead ECG. Chest X-ray, is there is a pulmonary edema with a sinus tachycardia and her uh, 12 lead ECG. Of course, the patient intubated immediately in ER because of this hypoxia, respiratory failure, and respiratory distress. Uh, immediately and uh, connected to ventilator and then uh, she moved to ICU for further management. What we can see here is her blood gases which showed actually respiratory acidosis, pH 7.17 and uh, partial CO2 is 62.3 millimeter mercury. Uh, she, she is no more hypoxic after controlling her ventilation. Bicarb is okay. And this, her labs, the labs results ordered later on in ICU. There is a uh, mild elevation in troponin, start 0 0.5, then 0 0.3, then 0.56. Uh, CK is not that much elevated. CKMB is also uh, almost normal. Um, and down we can see her thyroid profile. We can recognize very, very, very low TSH and increasing both T3 and T4. To the right, her uh, labs chemistry, almost there is no much abnormality we can see. Um, almost okay, accepted. So further investigation requested in ICU is echocardiogram and uh, upon this uh, very uh, clear thyroid profile, the colleagues requested thyroid sonogram and later on after yeah, thyroid scan was requested. Her echo show left ventricular ejection fraction 50%, normal left ventricular size and uh, nothing more. There is aneurysmal atrial septum. Thyroid sonogram multinodular goiter with largest nodule 3.6 and thyroid scan revealed market increase uptake at 4 and 24 hour, all suggestive of hyperthyroidism. So for this patient, it looks like we are facing, uh, almost we are diagnosing now a, a state of hyperthyroidism, but which is very acute. Let us to have this question. Considering thyroid storm, I can tell all are to accept it is potentially fatal. It needs urgent treatment in ER and ICU. Uh, ICU admission. Uh, we must identify and treat triggering factor. It is common in young male. What do you think? Can you see a result drop? Yes, agreeing. It is common in female, of course. So what are the positive findings in this case? Actually, we are facing a patient with fever, with severe tachycardia. Uh, she's asthmatic with asthma exacerbation. Uh, there is a heart failure and pulmonary edema by uh, auscultation. Uh, might I forget to tell about auscultation, but also by chest X-ray. It looks like we are facing an anastomy. Uh, there is increasing thyroid hormone with suppressed TSH. So where we are, what runs in with the thyroid storm in this case? I can't tell. It's, uh, she's having a suggestive history. It's only suggestive because uh, having insomnia and anxiety, tremors, it might be an anxiety neurosis or any other, but it is very suggestive in this scenario. Having fever, high fever, 
having tachycardia might be out of proportion to this fever and with this clear thyroid profile. Uh, actually, we told we have to search about trigger. So what's the trigger here? This patient is not diagnosed before. She denies any history of any diagnosis of thyroid. And of course, there, is no, there was no treatment. So she, this is her first presentation. She's the first time presented with this acute condition. Also, stress of being in acute asthma exacerbation might be a, a precipitating factor. What the other diagnostic tools? Actually, there is two or more, be more uh, uh, scoring system to identify and help to stratify um, a thyroid storm. Uh, we might like to be to have a scoring system. Uh, usually, scores are, are sensitive, but they are not very much uh, specific. Let us to have a look for this score, which is usually the one used. Uh, actually, this is an overview about thyroid storm. It's a rare life we told, life threatening, again, high mortality. We have a triggers and we have a scoring system. And this is Porsche and part of a ski score for thyroid storm. Uh, it gives points for uh, thermoregulatory dysfunction, for cardiovascular dysfunction, congestive heart failure, GIT and hepatic dysfunction, central nervous system disturbances, and also for the presence or absence of precipitating uh, factor. A score of more than or equal 45 means we are in a storm. A score less than 25, it is unlikely to have a storm. Between 25 and 44, actually we are approaching, we are impending uh, storm, and we have to be very aggressive in treatment to avoid being in a storm. There is another scoring system. This is Japanese score. It's very similar actually, but it is more validated for Japanese population. Um, actually, I cannot find different difference between both of them. Let us have this question. Uh, considering rule of catecholamines in thyroid, uh, uh, thyroid storm, there is increased availability of adrenergic receptors. It increases the catecholamine, increases uh, thyroid hormone binding to uh, thyroid binding globulin. It stimulates thyroid hormone synthesis. Beta blockers are one of the drugs triggers uh, thyro uh, thyroid storm. Sorry for this mistake. Actually, this is what believed about the pathophysiology and one of the most believed theories about pathophysiology of having a storm is the interrelation between thyroid hormone and catecholamines. In thyroid storm, there is a great availability of adrenergic receptor uh, with reduction of binding of thyroid hormone to its binding protein. It's more uh, free and easy yani, to work. And so the uh, released catecholamines with the stressful event that usually trigger uh, the storm having a great availability of receptor, so an exaggerated catecholamine response is there. What is the triggers? A lot of triggering. Uh, actually, uh, if I'm not compliant or I am just suddenly uh, stopping the uh, antithyroid medications, it might precipitate storm. Uh, having a major surgery, especially if this is a, thyro a thyroid surgery due to manipulation of the uh, gland, trauma, trauma, especially if the neck trauma, it is very much uh, can precipitate, pregnancy, labor, infection, of course, having uh, emotional or physical intense, of course, intense emotional or physical stress might have a, a, a rule. Um, cerebrovascular disease, thromboembolism, uh, pulmonary thromboembolism, or other triggers can, can lead to storm. So I can diagnose the storm uh, if I'm having a history of thyroid disease or thyroid treatment or suggestive history like our case. If I'm having an exaggerated symptoms and signs of hyperthyroidism, if I'm having a, a, a lab uh, like a very, very uh, low uh, or even undetectable TSH and high T3, 3 T3 and 3 T4. Symptoms and signs, fever of course, it's actually it can up to hyperpyrexia. 
uh, tremors, delirium, confusion, up to coma, uh, tachycardia, tachyarrhythmia, AF, one of the very common presentation, congestive heart failure, MI, cardiac events, um, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. What are the lab abnormalities? Of course, the thyroid uh, profile and the presentation. Hyperglycemia can be uh, like uh, cardiac enzymes and monostemy, um, electrolyte imbalance, uh, hypokalemia is famous and there is an entity of therotic supposes uh, induced hyper, hypokalemic or periodic hypokalemic paralysis. It's common in Asian population uh, and it might up to DIC. When I am treating this patient, actually I am uh, targeting the following. I am targeting to support the patient for whatever life-threatening situation. I'm using ABC's approach airway, breathing, circulation, and so on. So supportive measures. I have to search, identify, and treat the precipitating factor or factors. And of course, I have to limit the presence of high thyroid hormone release. I have to decrease its effect on the peripheral tissue, namely cardiovascular system. And here we can work with adrenergic blockers, beta blockers. And uh, I need to also to decrease or inhibit or even prevent thyroid hormone synthesis, antithyroid medication. I need to stop conversion of T4 to T3. So this is where the glucocorticoids work. And uh, uh, again and again, continue our supportive measures. We have to be uh, aware of some uh, warning points here. Uh, beta blocker is the one to start, propranolol is the best to choose, but you have to be careful with some patient, patient with hyperreactive airway like our patient, patient with obstructive, chronic obstructive airway disease, patient with myopathic heart and heart failure. Uh, actually, beta blocker is okay, uh, it, will, my, it will give a benefit, of course, when used cautiously and high output failure precipitated by the storm. Uh, but I have to work uh, very carefully in those patients. Even I might uh, go for calcium channel blockers to control heart rate if the patient is like an acute severe asthma or like that. Uh, Ismolol is an alternative to propranolol. This is coming in Japanese uh, guidelines, especially. Thionamides or antithyroid medication, especially propylthioracil. I have to be careful with its liver toxicity. Um, Probiothyroxyl is the preferred one because it works on the synthesis and at the same time it works also on the conversion of T4 to T3 in the peripheral tissue so it will, it will result in a prompt and very uh, nice uh, reduction in the level of uh, thyroid hormones. Um, iodine solution, iodine solution, uh, it will prevent release of the hormone from the gland. Uh, by working on iodide transport mechanism. Uh, this is, should be at least at least one hour after giving the first dose of thionamide, especially, this, especially for toxic nodular goiter, goiter or toxic uh, thyroid adenomas, because otherwise this hyperacting uh, uh, or hyperactive factory will use the iodine that I am giving as a substrate overcoming the uh, iodide transport and it will result in worse condition. Coming to the life-saving medications that we are in love in, uh, in ICU, glucocorticoids, hydrocortisone are the one to be given. Uh, here uh, it will uh, decrease conversion of T4 to T3 and at the same time it work in adrenal to support adrenal. There might be uh, some uh, relative adrenal insufficiency in this overwhelming stressful situation. Having bile salts uh, sequestrants by cholestyramine will prevent uh, the enterohepatic recirculation of thyroid hormone, so it will prevent reabsorption of the hormone again and help to get rid of uh, excess hormone. Of course, don't ever forget the triggers and don't ever forget supportive therapy. Cooling is one 
of the most important lines of management, cooling, cooling by cooling mattress and other cooling methods, uh, antibiotic, uh, be careful about aspirin, it increased level of thyroid hormone through its working with the binding protein. Acetaminophen, also, uh, of course, is the one to be used. Um, and some cases are refractory to uh, treatment, uh, or there is a contraindication for using antithyroid medication like uh, toxicity or allergy to thyroxyl or other antithyroid drugs, uh, major adverse effect like hepatic toxicity. Some patients develop storm because they have a problem with the side effects of the antithyroid medication, so they have to stop it, and then they develop uh, storm. In this case, we have to work with other, with, with beta blockers, glucocorticoids, uh, bile acid sequestrants, and plasma exchange or plasma pharesis was uh, very much helpful in some cases uh, with refractory uh, response or contraindication use of antithyroid medication. Uh, it can uh, clear the hormone and it can clear also the antibodies and other immune complexes if the resultant uh, engraves disease, for example, or uh, in some cases reported with a granulocytosis uh, with uh, antithyroid medication. Even thyroid artery embolization, there is some literature speaking about that. And we have to go for emergency, uh, emergent thyroidectomy course after a very good preparation of the patient. Preparation, beta blocker, glucocorticoids, antithyroid, or even the plasmapharesis if it's contraindication, it's advised to have the uh, surgery uh, after adjustment of the level of hormones, five to seven uh, days, not, uh, not to uh, delay more than 10 days. It, is, uh, it might turn to be worse situation with what's called wolf check of escape phenomena. The local iodine initially can block the transport mechanism uh, and prevent release of uh, 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 thyroid hormones, but by time, an adaptation and feedback, feedback mechanism will work, and this iodide transport mechanism can overcome the block and now the gland can use uh, the, what we give low, uh, iodine solution to be a substrate, increasing more and more production of the hormone. This is a summary for the uh, uh, management of uh, thyroid storm. Again and again, it's a multidisciplinary approach as all uh, our problems. We have to uh, work with uh, clinical pharmacists for medication, side effects, and others. And we have also to work with endocrinologists. It's very important to cover other uh, specialty according to the patient presentation. Now we have to shift to another problem with thyroid gland with thyroid hypofunction. And let us to go for this question. Myxedema coma associated with high incidence of hypertensive crisis with anxiety irritability uh, as, as a cardinal features. Uh, it is one of the differential diagnosis in case of hyperpyrexia. It may present with convulsion. Yes, of course, it can, uh, of course, with convulsion, can be the first presentation. Actually, uh, if the storm is the state of hyper or exaggeration, we are in state of hypo or insufficient. Just to have this another real, uh, real life case, 72 years old female patient found unconscious in her home. Uh, her family gave a history uh, negative to any medical illness or any medication. Uh, when she's presented to ER, uh, she was comatose, GCS 3 over 15. Uh, vitals, uh, she is very much hypoventilated, six breath per minute, her respiratory rate, heart rate 40 only, beat per minute, temperature 32.7 degree, her blood pressure 60 over 40, saturation of room air was not detectable because of this uh, very low blood pressure and others, and also hypothermia. 
she was immediately intubated on her and this condition, connected to mechanical ventilation, and was put on vasopressors and IV uh, fluid uh, policies. And uh, she was put on uh, warming uh, blankets. On general examination, she her skin was very cold, clammy, uh, scaly. Uh, there is generalized edema, numbing, especially pretibial. Her ECG show low voltage sinus bradycardia uh, with long QT interval. Her labs lactate 2.8. Uh, hemoglobin 4.2, serum sodium 123, 12 lead ECG, this radicardia, uh, CT brain uh, uh, after stabilization, of course, was unremarkable. Uh, sorry for this uh, transition of the picture. Her uh, CT chest shows pericardial effusion. Uh, she, was, of course, shifted to ICU immediately, continued, continued on uh, vasopressors and other support, mechanical ventilation. She was given empirical antimicrobial therapy uh, as per local protocol, together with uh, continued warming efforts. Uh, pericardio synthesis was done, draining almost 900 mil, uh, but actually this was not associated with improvement of her hemodynamics. Uh, shortly after her admission to ICU, she started to have amyoclonic seizures uh, and patient was put on anticonvulsant and EEG was uh, planned to be later. Her labs showed the following, TSH 52.45, uh, total T3 uh, less than uh, 0.75, total T4 less than 14. And uh, with the checking with the normal reference, it's very low, T3, T4 with very high TSH. CK was very high. Uh, she was underwent CSF analysis to check for this uh, coma uh, for infection. It was unremarkable, actually. So in this case, what, what are the positive findings? We have a patient, female, uh, old female with hypothermia and bradycardia. She is in deep coma, negative CT, negative CSF. She is shocked uh, with pericardial effusion. Tapping of this effusion or pericardial synthesis does not improve the condition. And uh, her thyroid profile was very much uh, characteristic. So what run with uh, myxedema coma in this case? Actually, I can tell she's hypothermic. Uh, other suggestive symptoms of bradycardia, hypoventilation, bradypnea, of course, with the uh, thyroid profile. What I can tell in the, our case uh, is a trigger. Uh, again, this patient presented for the first time with no history of previous diagnosis of uh, hypothyroidism, no treatment, and she might be stressed. She might be having some infection also. Um, what diagnostic tool? Actually, there is no so much scores regarding uh, myxedema coma. We are depending on the symptoms, clinical pictures, plus lab data. So it has to have uh, some uh, words about myxedema coma. It is uh, rare, fatal, uh, coming in women, usually old, uh, even with treatment still, uh, this might end badly into uh, mortality. Can be triggered by exposure to cold, by infection and sepsis, by labor, surgery, congestive heart failure, any ev uh, stressful events. Uh, clinical picture, as we know, she, the patient might present as coma, convulsion, or even uh, agitation and uh, confusional status, sometimes like uh, the, it was told like myxedema, madness, Hypothermia, it's a very common feature. Uh, generalized edema, the characteristic feature, macroglossia, bradycardia, and other uh, characteristic features. Diagnosis using history, presenting symptoms and signs, and lab values. ECG echocardiography might trend in pericardial effusion, cardiomegaly, uh, increasing thickness of cardiac walls, and reduced cardiac output. 
CT brain, of course, to differentiate the situation from other differential diagnoses. What are the treatment? Once more, we have to support the patient to keep her alive. Same like uh, in hyperthyroid or thyroid storm, ABCs again, a check for the triggers, check for the triggers. Um, especially in, in hypothyroidism, uh, due to the very common association with adrenal insufficiency, you have to think about adrenal insufficiency while you are thinking about thyroid uh, or myxedema coma. We have to give the hormone, the deficient hormone. We have to give steroid and uh, correct the complication, electrolyte disturbance, and so on. This is a summary for what we told. So thyroid hormone replacement, how to, uh, shall I replace T3 alone, T4 only, both of them combination of T3, T4. It is a, a, an area of uh, controversy because when you are giving thyroid hormone, you have to be very cautious about the cardiac response. You might increase uh, mortality of the patient because you are uh, overwhelmed the uh, cardiovascular system. Um, one of the very, uh, one of the agreed uh, techniques to give uh, T3 and T4 be with a monitoring. If the patient can be given uh, an uh, if we are uh, using an intra route, they can be given through the nasogastric tube or IV uh, is an alternative route. Um, we have to monitor thyroid hormones if it's given oral every one to two days, if it is given uh, intravenous at least one hour after the dose. Uh, we have to be very cautious, be having a uh, close monitoring of the cardiovascular system, hemodynamics, and other uh, uh, levo, uh, levothyroxine can be given as 200 milligram IV, followed by 50 to 100 milligram uh, or microgram per day, um, followed by our uh, associated with T3, 5 uh, to 20 mic IV followed by 25 mic uh, every eight hours. Uh, can be oral, uh, if the patient can swallow, or through nasogastric tube, we can uh, prepare a solution. Uh, that's why pharmacists, clinical pharmacists should, should be with us. Um, can be given as a retention enema sometimes. Uh, there is um, opinion about which is more efficient, having it through nasogastric uh, pathway, uh, nasogastric tube, or through the enema, but both can be used. Uh, you, you can agree whatever you want. You can adopt one of the protocols of giving uh, thyroid hormone replacement. Again and again, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Endocrinologist is, should be available, involved, and a discussion should be carried between intensivist and the rhinologist and also clinical pharmacist. This is a summary for a treatment of a thyroid, a hypothyroid coma, myxedema coma. It's multidisciplinary. It is fatal condition. We have to diagnose and treat thrombity. Don't ever uh, forget supportive management and searching and treating triggers. There is an entity which is uh, eutheroid 6 syndrome. Uh, it is abnormal thyroid uh, profile in patients with, with no uh, thyroid illness. We can see a lot in, in our critically ill patient. Uh, usually you have to rely very much on the cl uh, clinical data. It's again some, sometimes confusing. Uh, TSH here is not that much low. It is uh, it might be normal or uh, high, uh, normal at least, or not, not that much low. But again, this might be similar to, uh, um, sorry, sorry, uh, TSH is not that much elevated. We are in hypothyroid state. Um, this might be a primary, uh, a secondary uh, due to pituitary failure. And um, we have to differentiate depending on the clinical approach, a clinical data, clinical presentation, you might uh, go for detecting autoantibody levels to differentiate between uh, primary 
uh, hypothyroidism or it is uh, thyroid sex syndrome. Uh, it is not an emergency. It is a finding we are seeing a lot in critically ill patient and it needs discussion and uh, relating the labs to clinical data and usually it's, there is no need for any treatment. Going to second part of our uh, lecture today is adrenal uh, gland emergencies going to adrenal hypofunction. Acute adrenal insufficiency it is what we will discuss. Let us to have this question. In adrenal crisis, the body is unable to respond to an acute stress. Uh, is an acute status of marked increase of adrenal hormones. It is exclusive uh, or exclusively a sequelae of Addison disease. There is deficiency of mineralocorticoids activity. Yes, of course, uh, the body is unable to respond to this uh, overwhelming uh, or stressful situation. Another case, 66 years old men, actually when in thyroid you are speaking about ladies, here we can tell uh, it can affect male again, uh, known to be heavy smoker, hypertensive. Uh, he was on 18 hours overseas trip uh, from States to Cairo. Uh, he was feeling unwell after his arrival, attributed, uh, attributed this to uh, the long journey and jet lag. Uh, after his arrival, two days after his arrival, while the patient is still complaining of sense of weakness, he was having malaise, low-grade fever, sore throat, non-productive cough, anorexia. He got repeated attacks of vomiting, diarrhea, which was initially treated as gastroenteritis. He used some of OTC's medication, but his condition did not improve. Uh, there is more uh, three episodes of syncope followed by brief loss of consciousness. So the patient was taken to the nearest hospital. On examination, his temperature 36.4, uh, his heart rate 120, blood pressure 70 over 45, respiratory rate 30 per minute. His saturation of room was okay, 99. There is decreased urine output. He was drowsy, generally weak, no focal neurological deficit. Uh, his mucous membrane was uh, very dry and his eyes were uh, sunken. Uh, his labs showing sodium 117, 117, uh, potassium 6.1, urea 88, carriat 2.6, blood sugar 40, and at that time he was given 150 ml of dextrose, 25% for emergency hypoglycemia. Uh, during his ICU, he was uh, diagnosed as pre-renal acute kidney injury, and uh, this attributed to dehydration, hypotension. So he was well hydrated, blood pressure was managed with vasopressors, um, cardiac cause by echo was ruled out, there was no cardiac abnormality. Uh, actually, acute kidney injury was improved. Um, by labs and clinically, but with no improvement of hypotension, malaise, weakness, and hyponatremia. So as uh, to complete his uh, profile, a morning serum cortisol was obtained and it was low. Uh, so uh, stimulation test was performed uh, before administration of uh, hydrocortisone uh, and also pituitary panel was obtained. His ACTH was low, uh, morning serum cortisone basal was low, and post ACTH stimulation, 30 minutes was both less than expected. A further history was taken from the family and, and uh, the patient was having attacks of Cough, and he was having some skin problem while he was in uh, states and he was received a uh, steroid for both his stress and skin condition. Um, he was like COPD and chest x-ray. Um, this steroid therapy was continued more than uh, six or eight weeks um, but the patient when he was preparing for his trip, he was not that much compliant. He missed one or two doses. 
in the last week before uh, his trip and uh, actually he was not taking his medication during this 18 hour flight and many stops. Let us to tell what are the positive findings here. I have a male patient coming with weakness, malaise, anorexia, vomiting, diarrhea. He's hypotensive with dehydration, hypoglycemic, hyponatremic. There is renal impairment. Uh, he has having low ACTH and low serum cortisol with positive ACTH stimulation test. Let us to check. What runs with uh, adrenal crisis in this case? I can tell symptoms is very suggestive, but actually it can be any other reason. There are a hundred uh, cause lead to vomiting and then uh, shock dehydration, weakness, gastroenteritis might be a cause, yeah. But actually we have vomiting, weakness, shock, hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, uh, but what what uh, positive here in this case is that the patient uh, was on chronic steroid therapy for, for almost eight weeks and he was not compliant for this man at treatment in the last few days, in the last week, because of his trip, because of like his illness. Uh, what is the precipitating factor here? It's a sudden stop of chronic steroid therapy. Yes, stress. He might have this productive cough, chest infection, stress, a physical and mental stress of this very long trip. Is there any diagnostic tool? Yes, I have a suggestive symptoms. I have a suggestive science lab with low uh, cortisol and ACTH level. And we have to connect, we have a hypothalamus releasing CRF, corticotropin releasing factor, which is stimulated anterior pituitary to release ACTH, which in turn stimulate uh, adrenals to release cortisone in response to uh, stress. If I am taking uh, an exogenous steroid chronically, and there will be a uh, our uh, negative back inhibition on hypothalamus and uh, uh, anterior pituitary uh, to stop and then on adrenals. Actually, I'm inhibited. My res uh, stress response is inhibited. We will speak about Addison disease. Addison disease, it was described first time 1855 by uh, physician Thomas Addison, who also described the pernicious anemia uh, it is uh, uh, it was uh, described for the primary adrenal insufficiency. It's a primary adrenal insufficiency. The adrenals were uh, destroyed either by TB, by infection, by tumor, but this and a primary adrenal insufficiency due to failure of adrenal gland. Um, of course, the introduction of cortisone as a therapy was improving too much the mortality in this disease. Uh, acute adrenal insufficiency, it is a crisis. It is an exaggerated form of adrenal insufficiency, but it can be because of either ad primary adrenal insufficiency or secondary due to pituitary failure. It's an acute status of severe cortisol and or aldosterone deficiency triggered by any stressful event, uh, surgery, infection, emotional trauma, and again, and severe stress in which the body cannot respond to it properly. And the body is not able to release sufficient cortisol because of the feedback inhibition. In this case, with resultant acute exacerbation of symptoms uh, in uh, the patient might be Addison disease, it will be exaggerated all the time. He will be like our patient presented with acute Addisonian or acute adrenal insulin. And these are the causes, acute and chronic causes, which might lead to adrenal insufficiency. And they are triggers, again, it's almost the same. And clinical picture, it's hypotension, shock, maybe renal uh, impairment, acute kidney injury, like in our case, uh, together with characteristic hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, and low uh, cortisol level, and ACTH. Again, the management is supportive. We have to work with APCs and control the patient's condition that might threaten his or her lives. 
and uh, searching and correcting the triggers together with giving the steroid replacement. Um, the prevention is very important in the patient on chronic uh, uh, steroid therapy, especially if the patient is facing a stress like surgery, for example. We have to uh, certify this uh, severe or mild or moderate uh, stress and to give an extra dose of uh, exogenous steroid for those patients to cover the increasing stress. There is uh, what this a situation we are facing again in our critically ill patient. It is a critical illness related uh, corticosteroid insufficiency, uh, like in case of sepsis and septic shock. And uh, this is the base for steroid uh, and sepsis, for example, septic shock, I like that. And our last point to be discussed in this uh, uh, lecture tonight is adrenal hyperfunction. Actually, it, I am, I'm going to cover a situation which is really uh, scary. It's a fecromocytoma crisis. Let us to have this question again regarding fecromocytoma crisis. It's a common cause of hypertensive crisis. There is a market increase gonadotrophins hormone. ECMO might be the only solution, usually presented with heart block. Actually, it's not a common cause of hypertensive crisis. It's a rare situation. Uh, I mean, uh, there are many, 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 many causes of hypertensive crisis are common, but this is not a common cause. Uh, so I, the common here is the problem. It can cause, of course, a hypertensive crisis, and we have to be aware of this uh, cause because it, we have to modify the treatment sometimes for this situation, but uh, it also it uh, catecholamines, gonadotrophins, uh, hormones, where the problem uh, is about uh, catecholamines, uh, but uh, actually extracorporeal membrane oxygenator and extracorporeal uh, support might be the only solution for a patient. Uh, to uh, yeah, to save a patient in this situation, it of course it's not uh, presented with a heart block. Let us to proceed. This is a case. Uh, actually, it's not a, a life, a real life case. Uh, this case I quoted from a literature. Um, a 37 years old female, history of borderline hypertension, underwent elective and C operation was uh, vaginal bleeding, menorrhagia. Uh, in, her rec in the recovery room, after uneventful short intraoperative course and full recovery from anesthesia, she suddenly got syncope uh, and then was found and pulse oximetry saturation is 80%. She was connected to oxygen. Uh, blood pressure was measured, it was very high. Oxygen therapy uh, did not improve uh, her saturation. So the patient was intubated immediately. Secondly, to severe hypoxia resistant to uh, oxygen therapy non-invisibly. And by examination and uh, bedside x-ray, she looks like having acute pulmonary edema. She was pushed to ICU immediately where the ventilator parameters adjusted to improve oxygenation of the patient. Upon ICU admission, sorry for this, sorry. Upon ICU admission, uh, her uh, blood gas is showing uh, severe acidosis, uh, pH 6.8, TO2 51, um, oxygen 71 millimeter mercury, lactate is 10. She was having hyperlactatemia. And again, ventilator parameters again and again adjusted to provide the best oxygenation for the patient and clearance of uh, carbon dioxide. So sedation and mass relaxation were used. Uh, for controlling of this high blood pressure, so we are in hypertensive emergencies, nitroglycerin infusion started, diuretics, and uh, uh, with uh, close control uh, our monitoring of blood pressure. Uh, temperature was 37.9, heart rate 150, cardiac auscultation, there is a gallop rhythm, uh, there was a diffuse rails all over the chest, 12 lead ECG, sinus tachycardia, uh, there was no significant ST segment changes, chest x-ray showing pulmonary edema, 
transthoracic uh, echocardiography showed uh, global hypokinesia, biventricular dysfunction, LV ejection fracture 25%. Uh, cardiac troponin uh, was over the normal. It was considered that the patient is having uh, toxicity uh, mostly uh, related to catecholamines and this way uh, it was considered in the uh, diagnosis. The family was questioned further for any uh, clue for her condition. Uh, she gave, uh, a hist they gave a history of 12 month history of uh, recurrent episodes of palpitation, diaphoresis and headache. Uh, with this history, the team thought about uh, fake chromocytoma. They requested 24 hour urinary vinyl mandelic acid, it was high and urinary catecholamine was very much high. So diagnosis was made as hypertensive emergency due to fake chromocytoma together with acute pulmonary edema, cardiomyopathy, and hypertensive encephalopathy as the patient's consciousness was also uh, affected. CT abdomen was decided, but actually the patient was completely unstable uh, to be moved to CT department so ultrasound was requested. Uh, it can show the right uh, adrenal mass. It's a very weak mass with cystic change, solid with some cystic changes. During her ICU uh, stay, the patient received control of her blood pressure, fentolamine infusion, uh, together with nitroglycerin for better control of her blood pressure, uh, and of course to achieve alpha blockade after uh, uh, diagnosing the fibromocytoma. Oxygenation was not improved even with all efforts to uh, adjust the ventilator. Uh, blood pressure initially it was resistant then become very labile and uh, high and low later on on the fourth day blood pressure continued to drop so all antihypertensive medication were stopped and uh, monitored fluid challenges were given. So we can give fluid without being overloading the patient. And later on, vasopressor with lipofid started. Uh, hypoxia was, were, was refractory and no improvement in hemodynamics. ECMO was the solution decided. Actually, unfortunately, this patient did not receive ECMO because it was not available uh, in her uh, this center and communication done to transfer her. Um, to ECMO Center. Uh, unfortunately, this was not ever done. Circulatory collapse continued. Response to increased doses of vasopressors and inotropes later on. Refractory circulatory and respiratory failure leads to cardiac arrest and patient declared it on the day six of her presentation. A very sad story in this one. But again, what are the positive findings in this uh, case? We have a hypertensive crisis, we have pulmonary edema, we have a suggestive history that what about the episodes of uh, high blood pressure, diaphoresis, palpitation, and uh, cardiomyopathy, encephalopathy, increasing catecholamines in urine, and ultrasound finding, finding uh, of this adrenal mass. Actually, ultrasound is not the uh, gold standard for diagnosis. CT is the best, uh, uh, but it's not always feasible to get the patient out of the ICU. So what run with the uh, fibromocytoma crisis in our case? Uh, hypertensive crisis, tachycardia, cardiomyopathy, such as the history, lab data, what is the precipitating uh, factor for this uh, crisis? Uh, looks the patient is suffering of fibromocytoma. She was not diagnosed and she was not treated. Uh, surgery and anesthesia, they are known to have uh, to precipitate fibromocytoma. Is there in diagnostic tool, the clinical presentation plus Labs imaging to diagnose uh, adrenal uh, uh, as the cause of this exaggerated catecholamine release, uh, CT or MRI. So again, for chromocytoma is an undefined tumor of chromaffin cell of adrenal medulla. This is the most common place 
the tumor, but other places are very much less common. Uh, chromaffin cells uh, produce store and secrete catecholamine, and uh, all presentation clinical pictures of fake chromocytoma attributed to excessive catecholamine release. The presentation is variable. It might be silent, diagnosed uh, by, uh, by luck, uh, or characteristic signs and symptoms, or maybe like our, uh, our case, uh, maybe the first presentation at the crisis. That's in Ukraine emergency, significantly high mortality. Uh, of course, there is end organ damage uh, and human instability. If well treated, it can be uh, reversible. Uh, these are types of clinical presentation for chromocytoma, either asymptomatic or symptomatic, the usual, or a crisis. We can identify two types of crisis. This is type A uh, with hemodynamic instability and organ damage or dysfunction. Uh, one organ, at least, there is damage. Type B is extensive uh, crisis with shock. And type A, the blood pressure is very high, and type B, uh, uh, we are in hypotensive shock state, of course, multi-organ uh, dysfunctioning. Uh, these are the clinical spectrum, cardiac, uh, respiratory, neurological, renal, hepatic, almost all organs can be affected. A precipitating factor, again, no treatment, insufficient treatment, uh, trauma to the abdomen, through the adrenals, uh, to the tumor itself, either surgical or uh, it might be a physical trauma or surgical trauma during biopsy can be. Uh, general anesthesia, surgery, um, intubation, some drugs can lead to a, a crisis. A common diagnostic uh, dilemmas here. It, this presentation can simulate uh, acute coronary syndrome, cardiomyopathy, cardiogenic shock, septic shock, preeclampsia. Um, pathophysiology is there is an excessive catecholamine with a profound arterial vasoconstriction, uh, tissue ischemia, and uh, if we are in shock and uh, sustained hypotension. Uh, this, uh, we are in type B, and this uh, excessive B2 beta 2 receptor stimulation with excessive vasodilatation and some tumor with adrenaline, especially adrenaline. Uh, when to suspect uh, fibromocytoma crisis, uh, unexplained shock, multi organ failure. Uh, this shock is not uh, corrected even with correction of many factors, but history, of course, unexplained lactic acidosis. Actually, it's a rare condition, so we have to keep it in mind not to miss. What is the management, the usual? Supportive emergent resuscitation management, ABCs, uh, fluid and uh, vasopressors if needed, enotropic support if needed, mechanical circulatory support might have a very important role. Um, for controlling your blood pressure, we have to think about alcohol first. After good blocking of alpha receptor, we have to think about uh, going with beta blocker. Uh, calcium checkpoint blockers as uh, uh, alternative, magnesium sulfate, same like where, where we are in preeclampsia, uh, or direct vasodilator agents, uh, again combined blockades using more than one uh, uh, antihypertensive uh, medication. Beta blocker should not be used prior to alpha blocker. This is our rule. A low dose of short acting beta blocker like Osmolol uh, with careful monitoring is very much preferable. La beta lol uh, better to be avoided because the ratio of alpha to beta is not uh, very much the same for every patient. Uh, it's better to use alpha blocker pure first, then after blocking alpha receptor, we will go for beta blockers. Uh, for hypotension and uh, type B or advanced type A uh, fibromocytoma crisis, uh, fluid management, monitored of course, vasopressors, inotropes, intraortic balloon, and ECMO might be the only solution. Surgery, uh, 
should be like like in a uh, thyroid storm. We should surge until the condition is stabilized. Uh, the patient very unstable. Uh, medical st stabilization has failed. We might go for emergency surgery. It's carry a very high risk of mortality. A laparoscopic, of course, is much much preferred than uh, open surgery. So for today, we finished uh, a heavy a heavy subject. Uh, actually, it's we not finish. We just highlight the important points. Uh, what we have to remember after finishing this uh, lecture today, uh, this night, actually ABCs, we have to thank ABCs. We have to, when we are seeing a critically ill patient, we have to support him or her. We have to manage what can kill the patient and then to think about a specific therapy. Multidisciplinary approach is the key in our critically ill patient, it's a guarantee success in emergencies. Always think in rares. Rares, you have to keep in our minds not to overlook, and uh, if, especially if the response is not in the scenarios. Uh, always set a trigger. Always search, identify, and treat triggers. Vomiting and diarrhea are not always uh, uh, gastroenteritis. There are many very lethal causes uh, presented for, with vomiting and diarrhea. Uh, serum glucose should be checked for any unstable patient, actually any unstable patient, those with altered mutation. Uh, steroids are uh, our loved medications, are life-saving. Thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Prof. Salwa. Uh, I'll just put the poll here to document attendance uh, while we're discussing here. So I got a nice question from Tariq Abdul Maqsoud, and I think there will be the only question for tonight because it's 10 o'clock here and 11 o'clock in Cairo. We are a bit, like I know it's, it's a huge amount of teaching tonight. Uh, thanks for all attendees that were patient with us until now. So he is, Tariq Abdul Maqsoud is asking, uh, what's the safe medications if you are intubating a patient? who is presenting in emergency department with myxedema coma. Uh, he's talking about IV induction agents and muscle relaxant, given the fact that this patient is usually hypotensive, bradycardia, and sometimes he's presenting with seizures or convulsions. Uh, what do you think? Actually, uh, I can tell it the same for any unstable patient that we are uh, intubating. Uh, use uh, titration of different uh, uh, agents so uh, avoid suppression of hemodynamics. I'm, I'm using fentanyl for myself. Titration together with my benzodiazepine sometimes. Be, be careful. Um, even uh, propofol, but uh, we have to be very cautious. We have to uh, 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 properly monitor the patient because we might go into cardiac arrest while we are inducing the patient into uh, for intubation. Um, uh, this is a Dr. Samah uh, recommendation. Dr. Samah Salem, my dear friend and professor, uh, he is always telling, be careful, you might need to insert uh, an arterial cannula before going to intubate a patient who is critically ill. Uh, you might face a cardiac arrest while you are intubating the patient. Uh, start your support, start your vasopressors, start your fluid bolus, and go for intubation with a titrating dose of the patient titrating again and again. And uh, assess, for co of course, for uh, difficulty in intubation. It's a very difficult scenario when you are in ER or in ICU, imagine managing critically ill difficulty. So if you are using, think about succinyl choline or think about shorter acting, non-depolarizing muscle relaxant if you, if you are uh, having renal uh, problems with this patient. To avoid use sedation with a titration and keep monitoring your patient. Uh, if you allow me, uh, uh, Prof. Salwa, we may think in advance. So, if the problem is mainly bradycardia, you may give uh, some glycopyrrolate, uh, two to four hundred uh, microgram 
in in advance of your um, heart rate suppressing medications you may use if it's not rapid sequence induction you may, you may use the pancuronium the same policy we are using in cardiac anesthetics to offset the bradycardic effect of your fentanyl and narcotics and other drugs so think in advance you may use some salbutamol salbutamol or ventolin neps uh, to increase the heart rate before you intubate so make use of side effect of certain drugs uh, to make that happen and I am stressing on the point you said a, min a minute ago like we need an arterial line uh, monitoring heart uh, beat to beat variation in the blood pressure recording and uh, you can prepare the dobutamine the norad in advance if you have time for that if it is just an emergency and you don't have the time deal with it as an emergency case again atropine is your and adrenaline are your uh, first drug of choice in these occasions if you agree with me professor Lua. I, of course, agree with you. Even transcutaneous pacing uh, might be a very helpful in ER for the patient with severe bradycardia or heart block. Uh, it is a life saving, of course. You be ready with all uh, emergency medication. Agreeing 100%. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, the last thing here we want to say is uh, thanks very much for your attendance. We started with 230. Uh, until the last minute, we have been 210, almost 210 attendees. So uh, thanks for your patience tonight. It was lovely lectures uh, from uh, eminent speakers. Uh, my full appreciation for the speakers and the attendees. And see you next Saturday, 9 p.m. Cairo time, as usual, with uh, the week number 16. And keep monitoring the page. There is some modifications in the coming uh, schedule or schedule, how you pronounce it. Uh, uh, so uh, we have on 10th of October one of the eminent professors from Saudi Arabia he is a professor uh, Abdulaziz Boker and he's talking about an area I need every professor in Egypt attend this lecture actually it is the impact of simulation on anesthetic practice and anesthetic training uh, uh, professor Abdulaziz Boker is one of the eminent professors in, in the whole Middle East in this area so i would recommend you must attend particularly if you are practicing teaching and training coaching in your college uh, or your faculty of medicine uh, for now uh, thanks very much my full appreciation again and see you next saturday inshallah thanks very much see you bye thank you very much bye bye